so um, welcome, welcome everybody to this uh, third seminar <coughs> of the series that we are organizing with uh, Misha Gromov and Francois Kepes, uh, which is called Fun Fundamental Questions on uh, Amazing Logic of uh, Molecular Biology. And uh, this uh, series of uh, seminars uh, are about um, very interesting topics uh, in molecular biology. And uh, all these seminars are linked to a, a book that we are currently writing with Misha and Francois here. And it's a book which is about um, brilliant ideas and breakthrough ideas in uh, molecular biology. Well, we are writing, we are planning to write. Planning to write. <laughs> And um, today we are pleased to welcome uh, François Kepes. Uh, so François is a research director at uh, the ISSB, so Institute of Systems and Synthetic Biology, uh, which he founded inside uh, Genopole. And uh, he is a cell biologist uh, studying and engineering uh, genome architecture uh, using uh, synthetic systems and uh, molecular approaches. And uh, more recently, he founded his uh, own company, Synovans, if you maybe want to say a word about it. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction. No, I don't want to say anything. I will not read the patent for you that is pending. Um, okay, so as you understand from, uh, from this, this introduction, the seminar aims at uh, trying to uh, show how ideas came, came about in molecular biology. And I've really tried my best going in this direction. It's not easy, but at least uh, in one case where I've been working since 2001, I can at least testify for myself and, and trying to be honest about how the ideas came about. <laughs> and <clears throat> so that's what I'll try to recount here. And because you are scientists, to avoid frustration, in the end, I'll tell you the situation now with this, this uh, idea and project, uh, even though the main purpose is to indicate how it came about. I'll, you know, I'll just make some sort of a, re a final retrospective of where we stand with respect to this project now. Okay, so in the first part, I'll really try to e explain how the, um, and what were the influences, the people who uh, you know, brought something to the table that I, I used uh, and, and then how I used it and, and then, um, and then you know, how, how I tried to handle the, the issue. Okay, uh, so in this first part, I'd just like to express one one element that was pretty obvious long ago, but has been increasingly uh, documented. Um, <coughs> the, the people look at DNA often as an, an inert piece of information that can be read by interpreting the sequence of A, C's, G's, T's along the DNA strands. This is really, I'd say, the minimal information we can draw from DNA. DNA encodes, and this we are well aware of, encodes the, the sequence of the macromolecules, RNA, protein, and so on. But it also encodes the level of their expression. And it encodes more surprising things, such as how fast should the protein, the protein, not the RNA, the protein, how fast should the protein be made at the beginning, a little later, 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 along the sequence of the protein. This is encoding, encoded in the DNA as well. Right? So here you see that we are already far away from the uh, just sequence of uh, uh, nucleotides or uh, amino acids in um, the RNA and the protein, the first, the first item here. Yet this is still forgetting a little p 
piece of information, which is that DNA is actually chemical and physical. It has a physical chemistry. Why do you want biology or life, organ, live organisms to not use this feature? Well, actually, it's not our choice. I mean, we are the outcome of this choice. Evolution made it. Indeed, DNA is also carrying information at the level of its physical chemical properties, including the folding. And it's more on that side that I'll, I'll dwell today, which is underlined here. Folding versus uh, expression. So now to the influences. The first influence for the story I'll recount to you is about the local organization of gene transcription. Benno Muller Hill, now retired, but at the time professor at the University of Köln in Germany, and also the writer of the first books and the first inquiries about medicine in the Nazi period. He, was, he inquired himself and wrote books about that. I'm not sure you know that. Benno Müller Hill showed, was the first to show the, this little twist to the story of Jacob Monod, uh, published in 1961, which is here is the here is the lac uh, operator that is where the, the uh, that's the DNA here, uh, where the regulator protein, like repressor in that case, will bind and influence the level of expression, that is the, the rate of transcription initiation of the downstream gene or operon, the lac transcription, lactose transcription unit. So that's this 1961 story. Muller Hill brought a, an important twist to it by showing that even though in the um, traditional scheme there was one binding site for the regulator, there were actually more than at least two, more than one. And that changes everything because it allows for what biologists call cooperativity or what uh, physicists would call a sigmoidal behavior. When you look at the effect versus the dose, you have an S-curve instead of a, 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 the, the simple uh, uh, one binding site uh, uh, configuration. We can reason with two, even though there may be three, four, but the, the, the result is the same. We do have cooperativity. And this he showed very, very well. So the, here, this, this cartoon is uh, showing some interpretation of it. So first of all, uh, there is more than one binding site on the DNA for this protein, which is <coughs> repressing <coughs> the expression of the genes. Second, the protein has two hands to grab DNA. It's divalent. Again, this is essential. Otherwise, how do you have any cooperativity? Um, whatever it is, a tetramer, a dimer, uh, an octamer, what is important is it is divalent. Okay, and, and so on this uh, cartoon, what you see is the protein bound to two operators, that is two binding sites, inducing a loop in between. And um, he showed that if the physiological repression fold is 1,000, that is, when the protein is bound, the level of expression is 1,000 times lower than when it is not bound. If you touch any of the features that make it divalent, you lose this. You go from 1,000-fold repression to 15-fold repression, 1,5. So you lose a factor of 70 in the control of expression. Well, it should be squared. It should be that big difference, right? When you have two factors, you can have squares. It's not just, right? Each of them, if 15, 15 by 15, you need more like about 200. How do you get? Why, why 200? Well, it's with a multiplied by five, or a factor by another factor, so you can't multiply it. Oh. Why you have more? 
No, but it's the same, pro it's one protein. It's really, it's one complex protein only. It's not more, it's not several proteins assembled. No, there are two factors constraining the behavior, right? And then usually in practice, it's in fact kind of multiplied, no more than that. Right? Oh, so you mean, you mean it should be 15 times 15? Yes. Oh. Uh, yeah, in terms of probability, but with the 15-fold is really without any effect. There is no, no loop anymore, right? And perhaps also, should we take into account, that you're right on the numerics, that, that actually there is more than two binding sites in this specific case. There are uh, four, ah, okay. um, but the two others are weak, uh, weaker. Okay, but this extra file, yeah. That is possible, yeah. yeah. It's exactly in the case there must be another roughly. Yeah. Um, so anything he could do, like for instance cutting this in the middle, mm -hmm. making it monovalent, or making the loop here, intervening loop, very, very long. But even something more subtle worked. Really subtle. So the physiological size of this loop is 93 base pairs, that's here. Okay, and you see the full repression. Don't look at the scale here, it's, it's an arbitrary unit, but um, it was 1,000 fold up there. But if you remove or add two nucleotides, two nucleotides, then you are down to 15, that's here. Just look at the, the points, uh, take two points back, words or two points forward, and you are down, okay? So it's extremely sensitive to removing or, uh, or adding two to eight nucleotides to could the... Hmm? Could different positioning in general. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's a matter of positioning, respective positioning of the binding site because yeah. the double helix is a 10, more or less 10, I mean, uh, nucleotide pitch. So if you move 10, it's okay. Yeah, that's what you see here, yeah. If you, if you remove 10, you're back up 20, 30 you're back up. I mean, it's a little bit then more than 30. And if you go forward, same thing. Actually, well, actually it can be used as coding. Given the standard, it can be period of time, it can add or not add, it can read it again by the way. Yeah. I mean, and this is more binary when several things be encoded this way. Mm. You mean, is it the only system that well, is? It's only two, but you, in, in ah. you can you can have these sequences using this kind of prediction. Yeah, you can, yeah. And um, uh, the, I said that there, were, there was a third binding site in reality here. Uh, it's not shown, but it's at uh, 401, 401 base pair. And same thing. Same thing. So uh, with I less... Between them and it's so here, the, this one I drew uh, with the main binding site is 93 base pair. But uh, there is yet another operator here at 401 base pairs. And again, that's like uh, uh, 39 yeah. turns or something. So that was uh, a lot of, that gave me a lot of inspiration. You'll see why in a, in a, in a, in a little while. Um, besides, some of these, these uh, it's difficult to read, Villa and Leibler 2003, actually. Uh, Misha, if you remember, we had we had uh, organized with Alessandra uh, yeah. and Paul Bourgin a meeting in 2002 right. in Avery. It was the first meeting really on systems biology in, in Europe and uh, we invited Müller-Hell and Leibler and that's how they met. And then a paper came out in 2003, the next year. And uh, in, another thing is Leibler is no longer working on it but Villar is still working on this story. <laughs> yeah. So that, that's one, one thing. How are the other cases like this? Yes. It's only for Lapaton or do you know is it like some, some other examples? Yes, there are many other examples. Yes. Yeah. The, but it was the first one. But in the higher periods? Because in this is the high eukaryotes? High? In, in higher eukaryotes, the situation. Is, is different. The distances are much longer and you have this notion of en enhancers, long distance enhancers and, and so on. It's, it's slightly different. The principle, I mean the physical chemical principle is, uh, must be the same but uh, the, the details are different. 
No, these ideas are going to have a very long pattern that there are particular proteins which can fold the brain you know, like that. And so there's extra mechanism. Yes. A pen and uh, yes. 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 Yeah. But, but you're mentioning about enhancement. It's in other cases. And is it promoter enhancer? What about repressor? How it's a, it's a... Here, actually, it's a repressor. Yeah, it's a repressor. It works both ways. It's about... Um, the strength of the control, not about being an activator or a repressor. Oh, okay. It's about the strength of the control, how much you can bind and stay. There are different ways to, to, to say, tell the story afterwards in the interpretation, uh, at the interpretation level. So for instance, Müller Hill would, would say the story like this. He would say it's a matter of local concentration effect. So if you have a, this loop of 92, 93 base pairs, Okay, you have to imagine that, of course, you have an on rate, but you also have an off rate. Now, the protein is there. Okay, so that's my two feet now, okay? And that's DNA here, okay? Uh, sorry, <laughs> I'm not sure you see my feet, but anyway. So, you, you have the two feet on the DNA, okay? Now, there is an off rate. At any moment, uh, one of the binding sites may be unbound, okay? I lift my, my foot. So, now, how much should I search to find it again? Well, if I'm still bound with the other one, I will search a small volume. If, I, if I'm unbound, fully unbound, then I have to search the volume of the cell. That's how we explain this, okay? Because we know that it goes on and off. So if you have only one foot on one side, then once you get off, you have to explore the whole volume of the cell, 10 to the minus 12 cubic centimeters. But if you are uh, still bound by one foot, then you have to explore 10 to the minus 4 times less volume, smaller volume. Or if, if it's 400 or 1, then it's 10 to the minus 14. But if you increase it, to 1,000 base pairs, as he did in some of his experiments, and it's 10 to the minus 13 cent cubic centimeters. It's not a big advantage, but this is a big advantage. Okay, and, um, and yeah, and uh, in, in the first approximation, the probability of getting both feet at the same time away, off, is the, the square of the probability of getting one off. And so this will not happen. I mean, in practice, it's like it will not happen. It happens to get one foot off, but it doesn't happen to have both feet off. I mean, reasonably, just because it's a square of the probability of the first one. So it's, it's very improbable. We are talking about a specific binding. The protein will stay uh, on average a uh, minute, an hour. Um, so, you see the probabilities are very low, so getting both feet off is, is really not probable. So, the, so the first piece of uh, reasoning that I, ha I made at the time was, let's go from intergenic to intergenic. Um, so here we were talking about the two binding sites of one, one gene, the lactose gene. Uh, how, uh, how about having longer loops and be having um, binding sites? So this is the, the binding protein which is repressing or activating the regulator protein. It's divalent, which is the case for almost all these uh, regulators. And now how about bridging two sites that are distant, that are not in the same gene? And how about... How about from intra to interchromosomic? Another chromosome and these proteins which were bound on one uh, chromosome by one site, now binding another chromosome. However, this, this, why not? But uh, besides some physical difficulties, when the distances become important, uh, to get uh, this, say, these two sites at the same place to bind the protein. Uh, there are other difficulties and notably um, I asked myself the question, how can, I, can, it, can the cells do this 
knowing that uh, we have hundreds of sites for a given regulator uh, to accommodate and knowing that we have um, hundreds of different regulators each claiming for their own lives and importance and relevance and actions, activity. Um, it was difficult to imagine for me, but I'll come back to that. Another source of inspiration which was distinct was the case of the nucleolus in, uh, in, uh, higher, in, uh, sorry, in eukaryotes. So <clears throat> you have this, this nucleus in the cell which was prominent. Uh, morphologists at the end of the 19th century using the optical microscope were able to show that there was a little organelle within the nucleus that they called the nucleolus. Okay. That was visible, visible with the optical microscope, no trick, almost no trick. So it turned out much more recently, and one, one of the person who, was, uh, who did an important work on that is uh, Daniel Hernandez-Verdin in, uh, in Jussieu. Um, <clears throat> so I mentioned her, her paper, but many people have worked on the nucleolus. I mean, it was shown that the nucleolus is actually not bound by a membrane or an envelope. It just exists out of its activity, to summarize. It's the place where there is a lot of activity of making ribosomes. That is one of the major elements in the cell. So it's massive in terms of what the cell has to achieve is to make ribosomes. Another way to see the importance of the ribosome is to, re, uh, to, to, to to, to notice that it's actually the point of self-catalysis because it's made of proteins and RNA, but it's made of proteins and it's the, the thing that makes proteins. Right? So it's the point of self-catalysis. So in a rapidly growing bacterial cell or a yeast cell, it's like a quarter of the dry weight. It's the ribosomes. It's only one or maybe two or more? Okay, so I'm not yet at the picture. <laughs> I'm coming to it. Okay, so so that, that's, that's just to, to have you feel how, uh, let's say, how active is this, this little place where ribosomes are made within uh, and assembled uh, within the nucleus, okay? Now, these are just images of fluorescent images of the, nucle uh, of the nucleus in, in activity. Uh, I don't remember what was labeled there. Uh, I forgot in the meantime. <clears throat> but it's, uh, you can tell this, these are images of the nucleus within cells, within nuclei, okay? So I think it is significant that this has no membrane and envelope of lipid membrane or anything uh, around it, but was considered an organelle. It's just made out of its own activity, the activity that it makes polymerizing RNA, assembling proteins with the well, RNA. Chemical. It's from most proteins or? Ribosomes, RNA and protein. Right, so RNA. We already have made ribosomes and proteins which made it. But this might ribosomes themselves in all of So It's the usual proteins made by a ribosome in the closed, which normally doesn't happen right in the nucleus. Um, it's not, it's no, exactly, exactly. No, you are right. So actually, to tell the story uh, more completely, so it's the place where the ribosomal RNAs are made. And uh, the messenger RNA that encode the ribosomal proteins, of course, are exported out of the nucleus, mm -hmm. are uh, uh, translated into protein, and the protein are imported back mm -hmm. to the nucleolus, and there they are assembled with the RNA that was made, and so on. So it's a it's a huge factory, really. It's very impressive in terms of activity. Um, and so this activity without envelope, membrane envelope, without envelope, actually, which self-assembles as needed for the work to be done, was enough to be seen as an organelle by the morphologists of the 19th century. A, a little bead in the, in the bead of the nucleus. Okay, so just to keep in mind that 
activity of uh, yeah, making RNA and so on can be focused in, 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 uh, in things that are very active, like such, that the nu such as the nucleolus. So it's another piece of information, again, that I thought was useful in the sense that um, at the time it was not so clear that there was an equivalent for, for the messenger RNA. But then some morphological work came. But at the time it was not clear. So it seemed to be the case only for the very active uh, ribosomal RNA assembly with... So then, happened, then what happened is then on, in August 2001, I was in Normandy by the beach, and I was on holiday. And I decided, because the weather was nice, that I would do like everybody else, I would go to the beach. So I took my, uh, my little uh, towel, and I went to the beach with an umbrella. And no more, I think, I can't remember, it was the 5th of August, for sure, but I think no more than 10 minutes later, I thought I had something to check. I thought that we had a problem. So I had in mind Muller Hill and the DNA loops and their importance. I had in mind the, uh, the nucleolus for the ribosomal RNA uh, that I thought perhaps we, we could use as a model for uh, some other things that were factories for the messenger RNAs of anything and um, I had in mind discussions with Vic Norris from University of Rouen about hyperstructures as well. But I couldn't see, as I, as I showed my, little two, my two little chromosomes, I, I, I couldn't see how the cell could do it. I had a little problem on that. Exactly uh, do what? Exactly um, how can the cell deal with uh, these little bacterial cells with 300 different factors transcription factors, regulators, each dealing with between one and 600 targets without some minimal order in the story. So I thought it shouldn't work. Of course, it was a total, totally qualitative reasoning, but without modeling quantitatively, which no one would have been able to do at the time anyway. And even now, I think it's very tough. I thought it could not work. And of course, I know that bacteria are around and have been around for uh, over three billion years. So I, I, I thought there must be a principle of organization that we have not looked at so far that should help. And um, the idea I had after these 10 minutes uh, on the beach was that it has to do with loops, but not loops at the size of what I showed, but larger loops that would allow for some phasing of any chromosome and would allow to aggregate things that belong together a bit like the nucleolus into transcription factories hyperstructures, but in the case of transcription, right, so transcription factories. Um, so I had, at the time I had, so I went back to the flat immediately and I had on my computer, I had some Excel sheets with the data that were published in 2002 about uh, the yeast uh, transcriptional interaction map. I had the data in an Excel sheet. So it's, a, it's sim simply a, a chart of, you know, it's a, it's, it's a simple chart of, says that, for, it was for yeast in that case, uh, it says that for this transcription factor one, this is the list of targets, targets A, B, C, and so on, and for transcription factor two, and we had assembled that and we published it in uh, Nature Genetics in um, April 2002. That's all. That, that's what I had on the Excel sheet. But I also had the sequence, so I knew where, where, I knew... Sorry, Michel? Affinity of the studies. Ah, affinity. Forget it. 
It's uh, yes or no. There is no yeah exactly. Okay. There is no weight on that. No. So position on the chromosomes. We had the positions from the sequence. In 1996. Yeah. So we. Uh, yeah. So that was on an Excel sheet and, and um, this is experimental. It's experiment. Yeah, it's not theory. Yes. Yes. And this was not experiment. Yeah. No. No. It was based on experiments. Yeah. Yes. Um, <clears throat> so these four. At the time, I think 54 of the 300 um, transcription factors, and these list, lists were not complete, but were already long. Mm -hmm. And so I used my, my Excel sheet, and uh, by midnight, I had the first result. And I have to say then it took, it took months and years to really work out this properly, and I'll say a few words about that later. But uh, yeah, so so, so the, you this found some pattern there, right? The, the point is to find a pattern, the logic. Yeah, yeah, find a yeah. pattern. Exactly, exactly, exactly. And there was a pattern, but my tools were rudimentary, and uh, the data were still not complete, and you know, lots of problems. But it seemed encouraging already by midnight the same day. Yeah. So um, so here. Here is a, a sort of an implicit lesson for the youngest of, of you in the room that it's important to get bored sometimes, actually. But, but understand, so you expect to have something like nucleol, nucleol. You have the, yeah. the, the same uh, localization, like uh, the yeah. close one plus all this. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, a pattern that would simplify the work of the cell a pattern on the DNA, on the chromosome sequence, that would simplify the work of the cell in order to organize itself internally for the purpose of doing all these things with 300 transcription factors, each repressing 1 to 600 targets, all at the same time. We are close one to other, right? Localized, like, like, uh, like in the case. Yes, but how do, you, how do you do that when you have these many transcription factors and these many targets and a total of 6,000 genes. Tell us what the pattern you found. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'll, I'll tell you the pattern that I found. Yeah, sure. No, it's actually uh, simple in a way, but uh, when you get to the details, it's actually complicated. But uh, it can be captured simply. So, so then I had this view that uh, if, if, we could or, if the chromosome was organized in such a way that uh, uh, genes belonging together, let's call them co-regulated genes or co-functional genes, could be together in space, in the space of the cell, then I would get the best from the world of Beno Miller Hill and the best of the world of the nucleolus. And here is a, a second uh, factor which, with targets as well, so, and, and there are more, of course. So that, that was more or less how it boiled down to, to, to this view. And, and in a very simple-minded way, the pattern I was looking after was, uh, that I, I imagined for a while was of this type. So imagine a solenoid. The DNA is coiled. Imagine you have periodic uh, positionings of the genes, the green genes that belong together, of the blue genes that belong together, and then you get some sort of a uh, a, a, a solenoid where if now you compress it in your mind, if you imagine that it is compressed, then you do have local concentration effects for the blue, local concentration effects for the green, but you don't have crosstalk between the two systems because they are actually far away on the solenoid by, because they have a different phase, right? And this is important as well. You don't want to have too many green guys in the area of the blue binding sites uh, on the DNA because they will bind. As we know, the on rate is the same whatever the factor and the binding site. It's the off rate which is very different. So the on rate, so because the on rate is the same whatever the segment of DNA we are talking about, then crosstalk is a, is a big problem that uh, the cell would probably avoid crosstalks between things that should not talk, crosstalk. So uh, one way would be to use the phase. Um, and and that, that, that predicted that <clears throat> if I look at... Phase meaning what is phase and what? Oh, what no, is phase that? is... Don't, don't, uh, 
nothing, not, nothing uh, specific. Uh, yeah, it's just a different place on the yeah. solenoid in phase view. It's, it's all. So do you know that in say for, for East how uh, organized DNA? It's because of chromatin organization like for all. Yes. Previous. Yes. 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 Yes, so but I. To be I'm not addressing this issue because I I, I don't know really uh, how to how this could fit with the chromatin organization. There is no contradiction, but I don't know how to draw that. This, what you say is happens. Yeah. I think it's, it's very fire, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yes, sure. So, actually, the current situation, a uh, few, so, some words. So, 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 maybe simple principle, if there are some regulatory factors that they cite, just Germans partially must be seen close together, right? Yes. At this stage. Yes. And this, of course, will be fire. This would be fire. It's experimental, you can check. Oh, uh, sure. Right. Sure. Yeah, so, very interesting, this may. yeah, sure. So, so the situation now, today. So um, it all started in 2001. The first papers were published in 2003 about that. And uh, currently there are about 26 papers on this topic, mostly for, uh, no, all from the team, plus there are maybe two papers uh, from outside the team about this topic. Um, and that's the situation. So what do we know in brief? Um, so this was just to present the idea. Uh, it's very naive, very simplistic. Uh, the patterns are actually quite complicated, but the notion of periodicity and proximity holds, even though we have sometimes several periods that overlap, we sometimes have uh, regions that do not fit, we, 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 we do have transcription factors that agree with the same period, we do have transcription factors that have different periods that are not reducible, to the, the first one and so on. So it's actually a bit more complicated than what this uh, view shows. What, so what happened is that we had more and more data with new transcriptomics methods at that time, 2000, 2001, 2002, with the so-called uh, chromatin immunoprecipitation um, and so on. So as a team, in some sense after that I should also say, besides the papers, that yeah, a, a couple of uh, European grants were granted for, for this work and so on until, until now. Okay, so, so that's the current view now. Um, the current view is, do not forget this. Do not forget the physical chemical aspect of DNA. The cells have not forgotten it. They, they take advantage of it. So it's, it is, a good idea to consider these three elements at once, rather than as people do usually to, to consider them by, as pair, by pair. At, but the three of them at once. So what are they? Genome layout simply means the respective positions of co-functional genes, genes that belong together, maybe co-regulated, maybe uh, you know, encoding proteins of the same complex or other. Co-functional gene, a respective positioning of co-functional gene. This is the expression of those genes. And finally, this is the confirmation of the chromosome, the physical folding of the chromosome. And uh, the idea is that it becomes important. Um, and so what we have to demonstrate and was in part demonstrated in the meantime is that the genome layout changes the folding. We, we showed that with the biophysical approach. I'll, I'll just show two slides about that later. Um, then that the chromosome conformation allows factories to be made for messenger RNAs, not, not the nucle in addition to the nucleoles, is, uh, is uh, you'll, see, you'll see the data. That this changes the expression is more or less the work of, uh, uh, first is the, the mass action law, of course, for all the chemists, but in the case of transcription was shown by Mürahel and others later. And finally, th there is another issue. How do we see patterns in current genomes, patterns that extend over the whole chromosome? And this is, cannot be uh, an, a random effect, right? There must be some selective pressure. And so, 
there must be some selective pressure to, to explain why these improvements to the control of gene expression lead to such a strong patterning of the genome. Um, on that side, little was done. We, we did publish in 2008 um, a paper where we, we show that, yeah, it's a model, you know, it's just a, a, an evolutionary model which seems to say, yeah, yes, indeed, that, that would, that effects on that would, will regularize the patterns uh, of the genome layout. But I mean, it's just a little evolutionary model. Yes? Did you try to, to do the correlation between the expression level of the transcription factor and this kind of uh, uh, um, localization. If the expression level is high, there is enough to, to, uh, uh, to manage at the different place. If it's low, then they should be more close one party. Did you try to do this kind of correlation? Okay, so you have to remember that we, we do have these kind of relations, but we do not have weights generally. We don't know how strong are the binding and so on. But one element of information that goes in your direction, and which I didn't say, I didn't mm -hmm. want to say, but it's a bit complicated, the, the complicating the story, is that in bacteria, not in yeast, not in other uh, eukaryotes with the nucleus, but in bacteria with no nucleus, there is a mechanistic coupling between the transcription, the translation, and even the insertion of membrane proteins into the membrane. Right? This, is, this has been known for a long while. So it means that before the, the messenger RNA is finished, it is already being translated into the beginning of a protein. And before the protein is finished, it's already inserted in the membrane if it is a membrane protein. And uh, so to get to, to your answer in an indirect way, because we don't, we don't have a... Yeah. Message is not finished, that the protein is already started to... Yeah, so <clears throat> because of this mecha mechanistic coupling, I asked the question, um, will the gene, now not, not the protein, but the gene that encodes this transcription factor be positioned in a neutral way? Or be positioned like its targets, in register with its own targets? And the answer is, in yeast, in eukaryotes, it's positioned randomly. In bacteria, the gene encoding the transcription factor is in register with its targets, very clearly. Sometimes it may be because this gene is actually under the influence of itself, of the, of the protein, of its product. Some other times, <coughs> it is not the case, and it's still in register. So, Think of it in terms of, in kinetic terms, and again, sorry for being qualitative, but this is sometimes how you actually understand things at the beginning. <coughs> sorry for being qualitative. Um, so uh, this gene encoding TF1 is there. TF1, uh, so uh, imagine there is a stress to the cell, for instance, oxidative stress. Uh, you, you, you have a little thing, you, you use H2O2 to, uh, to uh, what do you say, to disinfect it, right? immediately those bacteria will be under heavy stress. Now it's a matter of uh, seconds to, for them to react before they are killed by H2O2. Okay, so imagine uh, that this is the TF, the, the regulator for the response to oxidative stress. The gene is immediately induced, whatever the reason, I can come back to that, but it has nothing to do with this, my story. It is induced, okay? So it takes a few seconds to be made, uh, to make the, the messenger RNA, then a few seconds to make the protein. And then here is the protein. And the protein, remember my mechanistic coupling? The protein is made close to the gene in bacteria. And this has been shown uh, long ago, 1970. Uh, and again in 2010. Close protein, to the gene encoding this protein. Close, yeah, close to it. Because of the mechanistic coupling. Yeah. The protein is made, the RNA is still attached yeah. to the DNA, right? So this has been well shown. Okay, so now the protein is close to the gene. Okay, and now it will, if there is nothing special about the organization, it will sample the DNA of the cell. 
It has been calculated that given the on rate, which is not specific again, it will sample about 1,000 sites before it finds one specific one that is a target where it will stay. 1,000 uh, 1, wrong sites with, let's say, one-tenth of a second each. That's 100 seconds. It's too late. Now, if it's made close to its gene, and its gene is close in register, close in space, close in space, to the targets, we don't know how much it will sample, but less than 1,000. It's, it's already close to the targets. It will sample, but it may find the right targets after 10 attempts and not 1,000. I don't know, maybe 10, maybe 100. You save 10-fold or you save 100-fold. I don't know, but you save. Qualitative reasoning, sorry. You save something, okay? You save time. Okay, so that might be a reason for these genes to be in register with their targets, even when they are not uh, under their own regulation. Yeah. Anyway, it's an observation that I made in 2003 that they are in register with their targets in bacteria, not in eukaryotes. So, as you see, it's an indirect response. I, I cannot say more. <laughs> Sorry. So, it's in bacteria, but not in eukaryotes. So, so, in yeast, we do have we do have this phenomenon with patterns here, <clears throat> but the gene encoding the factor is is not in a spe special position with respect to the targets. It's not. <laughs> no, so, because you are talking about oxidative damage, right? Yeah. So, so, so usually, I'm just curious, you have the loops, right? So you have a, a chunks, right? And so, where is this is a, is a damage, the make damage can occur more easily. Because, oh, because, it's, the... it's, it's, because there's a term, because it, um, you could argue that the proteins are protecting the DNA as well. Right, right. So, so, so probably there you should check for the repair factors. Mm. DNA repair factors. It it's should localize yeah. where this is. Because I uh, understand this. Yeah. But when there is this uh, term of the, it's easily, it's, it's broken easily. It can be yeah. broken easily. Yeah, yeah. Just, just but, uh, for, for the oxidative damage, the targets would be many things. One would be something to destroy the H2O2. Another one would be to repair the DNA. Another one would be to uh, avoid that the lipids get oxidized. You have lots of, lots of things, but they all fit in this, um, in, in this uh, scheme, actually. So, now briefly, uh, just to give you a little update, um, okay, so I explained this, this notion that on top of the Jacob and Mono view from 1961 that is a view from the gene, I am a gene, I see the transcription factor come, bind to me, change, influence my uh, uh, initiation of transcription rate. Um, there is this, this Muller Hill view with short loops internal to the gene, to the same gene. And now with the notion that we sometimes have factors, regulators that agree on a certain pattern, they have the same pattern, we think that there may be a view from the cell on, a, on top of the others, a view where you see from the point of view of the cell that there is an, an overall organization for all of transcriptional activities in a live cell. And that's the, the idea that has not been fully proven, but we, we do know a couple of things. So what do we know, actually? So we know that from uh, many morphologists that a transcription of messenger RNA, not ribosomal RNA now, which are the nucleolus. Actually, you see the nucleolus here. In green is the activity of transcription. And red is just the background. So nucleolus is here in this human cell nucleus. Uh, but you do see 10,000 dots. I mean, don't count them. Uh, we invited Peter Cook, who uh, one time, some, some years ago, to talk about that. 1,000 spots of activity, of transcription factories that are for the messenger RNA, not the ribosomal RNA, which are in the nucleolus. But you do also see patterns and spots and dots in bacteria, as shown here. Okay, that's one aspect. 
Another aspect is this Müller Hill story, which I explained. That is exquisite sensitivity of the control, transcriptional control, over tiny changes in the loop sizes. <laughs> and, and third is what I explained I, I did. Um, <clears throat> just look at uh, uh, transcriptional interactions and given a one transcription factor, look at the positions based on the sequence, look at the positions of the targets and then do some simple math. <clears throat> Uh, and less simple math, now we, we elaborated uh, in 2010 uh, a new tool to, to deal with biological data because you'd say, okay, you, you're telling me that there is some periodicity. Okay, so let me use Fourier analysis or micro uh, wavelet analysis or something derived from Fourier. <coughs> it typically doesn't work because the biological data are, okay, as we know that. Um, we, we devised a measure which, which is based on information theory, which is rather simple, but has the advantage that <clears throat> it gives a bonus not only when we have several genes coinci coinciding on the solenoidal phase view, like here, but also when there's a void, an exceptional void or an exceptional de high density of genes will be, uh, will get uh, some bonus in this scoring system. And this has been published. So I am just, you know, to illustrate the path that we took and uh, don't want to get into the detail. It works very well and much better than Fourier on uh, real biological data. It, it gives peaks at uh, given periods like uh, 9,510 nucleotides and also double, triple, quadruple. Uh, so because of the data that we can feed in and on linear, so right? That the analysis doesn't work. It's not eligible, but it's still periodicity, but it's quantitative. Yes. Yeah, so I wanted to skip that, but yeah. um, see here, we took an example where there are two periods. Yeah. And for each period, we have several points. And then Fourier simply crashes totally. Yeah. Uh, this is minus noise, this is plus noise. And the, our method uh, works. Yeah, sure. So, and this 10,000 10, 10, base pair uh, is reminding us of <clears throat> the so-called uh, micro domains of the bacteria, bacterial chromosomes, uh, even though we, <clears throat> we didn't show that has anything to do, but it's the same size. Uh, again, besides the micro domains, there are macro domains in bacterial chromosomes <clears throat> with the origin of replication, the terminus of replication, and areas that do not interact much with the others but do, in, do have lots of interactions internally and not much externally. And uh, actually, the patterns that we see uh, fit. So for instance, the borders here, which was determined by biochemistry in 2004, that's a paper shown here, uh, are found by uh, the fact that uh, we have this period of 9,510 at, uh, centering a, a, about the origin of replication and taking up half of the chromosome. And then we have another period, seven kilobase pairs, uh, which is significant and which has these two uh, boundaries. Um, and actually, so it was fitting the macro domains except here. So uh, we, we talked to the, the authors of the paper and actually um, they said, no, since 2004, we changed our evaluation. We refined it and actually it's exactly there. Um, so you see that the macro domains and the micro domains might be might have to do with with this. Here again, I'll be again. It's just for illustration to avoid some frustration. This is proximity on the chromosome. The genes are next to each other, or this is and this is periodicity. That's when genes are periodically disposed and okay. It can be interpreted like this. So. Without going to the details, looking at all enterobacteria, including Escherichia coli, the proximity uh, phenomenon is lost after, or is no better, above about 20 kilobase pairs of distance. That is, you know, uh, you, you are the neighbor of, of you, and you are the neighbor of, of, of her, and so on. But at some point, I mean, are, are you a neighbor of Nazim down there. So the, the, the answer is here. The answer is besides 20 genes in a row, 
it's not really any more uh, proximal. Uh, just to the contrary, starting with 20 genes, we have periodicity in the groups of genes that are bigger, bigger than 20 genes in the group. And uh, altogether, and that's more important perhaps, so we have size effects, right? More important is, if we add up all periodic genes for the Escherichia coli, for instance, we get 500 genes, that's 12% of the protein encoding genes. They function in the synthesis of DNA, RNA, protein. That's one aspect, the functional aspect. Look at the interaction map, the transcriptional interaction map. They are in the core, they are most connected. But, very important for the biologists, we looked at all the sequenced uh, genomes of bacteria. We pushed these 500 genes, uh, we looked at the, uh, the, the homologs, the best homologs in all the 800 sequenced genomes of bacteria, and we found that the orthologs were periodic as well in all bacterial phyla. So it's a ubiquitous phenomenon, and I will not show in detail. The phenomenon is saying what? Just a uh, the, the collection of, of periodic genes in Escherichia coli, if you, if you look at the homologues, they are periodic mm -hmm. as well in, in all other phyla. So uh, okay, it, it's homolog of particular, it's a yeah. periodic here, periodic there. Yeah, uh -huh. exactly. Um, orthologs is a way to say in brief homolog, uh, and in principle the real homolog, mm -hmm. uh, based on some bioinformatics criteria. Um, okay, so it's true in all bacteria. It's true in one archaea bacterium we looked out of one, and it's true in one eukaryote out of one, which was yeast. It was the first one actually uh, we tried. So that's all we know. We don't know more so it's far. The same period. Or what? Sorry. In the same period, the same range. Of no. Period? No. No. Not the same periods. Some. Uh, yeah, it's always in the same uh, area, but it's not at all the same period. Yeah, it's just saying they cooperate. Yeah. 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 In the end, what's important is is uh, the the principle, mm -hmm. and now then you can realize it with different periods, which are in some yeah. sense arbitrary. And right. if you if you look at cousin bacteria, you'll find something similar. But if you look further away, it's going to be not similar, right? It's an arbitrary question, and this question of okay. So, um, what, what time um, we have? We had one hour. One hour. So I'll I'll uh, go a little faster. Uh, I'll I'll skip this, and just say a little word about the biophysics. Um, okay. So it's uh, uh, Monte Carlo Metropolis uh, model of a polymer where we have. Um, the notion of energy for the binding of the protein onto the um, DNA. The protein can grab the DNA with more than one hand. That's very important. And we also have a certain flexibility of DNA. We took the physiological parameters. We have the notion of flexibility, of uh, persistence length of the polymer. Um, given this, this one uh, model, one of the key results we had in 2010 was that if you, if you take a strand of DNA and you put sites for, let's say, red, green, yellow, blue, red, green, yellow, blue, red, green, yellow, blue, in a sort of a regular pattern with four equivalent of transcription factors, four regulators, four colors, then you get something which certainly is not a solenoid, I mean, this is polymer physics, uh, but is going through these colors one after the other in a regular way. Now, if this is not shown here, but if uh, your DNA is long, if your polymer is long enough, then you get uh, anomalies. It doesn't go circular like that. Uh, but with a short DNA, you get something rather solenoidal. Okay, that's one aspect. Now, if you randomize the sites and positions of these different colors, this is an example, you get two differences, two major differences. One is some genes, some dots, will not be accommodated. They will not be in groups with the others. So you would predict a 
weak, weaker transcriptional control. Second, all colors merge in the middle. So you would predict a high crosstalk between things that perhaps should not talk. Yeah. Whereas here, without putting it in the, in the, explicitly in the model, we got separated colors, no crosstalk. So that's the key result. And now, I mean, we, yeah, we, we did a lot more, including on mammalian uh, DNA. We, we used other approaches, like it's a Langevin type of model here. I'll skip that, really. It's not so important. Um, so conclusions so far. First of all, and that's mostly our work, cofunctional co genes tend to position periodically in all microorganisms so far looked at. And second, I alluded to it, I didn't show it. Uh, the gene spatial clustering favors periodical positioning in an evolutionary model. Third, if you do have periodical positioning, it will favor clustering in factories, in, in space. And this really we have been working a lot on. And also, as I sh just showed, the solenoidal organization of chromosomes. And finally, work from others, gene spatial clustering optimizes transcription regulation, uh, Müller-Hill and others. Transcription occurs in focal points. Focal meaning what? Hmm? What do you mean by focal? Oh, it, it, just gathering in, same, uh, in the same places. You remember the morphological data? Yeah, so that's, that's what I meant. So th these are the conclusions. This is how we understand the system now. And I'll finish in the last minute uh, by saying that, okay, these, these are observations and so on, but observations that are um, precise enough and bear on genes where we can say, this is the name of the gene, this is this gene doing this, precise enough that now we are envisioning that we can engineer genomes by applying the principles of natural genomes. If, One of them being you this. If you rearrange genes, if you not work in the, in the diet. Okay, yeah, so we have, on, we have work on, on, on going on that. We, have, we are rearranging, notably, in answer to your question, you know, I, I said that the gene encoding the factor in bacteria is in register with those targets, so we, we have moved the gene. We are waiting for the result, okay, currently. We've moved the, moved the gene that encodes the, the factor. We uh, expect to see the effect. And other, many, many other experiments are underway, actually. The problem um, is, when they have a very strong factor, it's possible. Uh, we, we think, yeah, reasonably. What reasonably. What kind of effect do you expect? What kind of effect do you expect? After well, you we, we think that the efficiency of translate, uh, that the transcriptional control will be, we, will be weakened. And this we can measure in principle. And so bacteria will suffer. They bacteria will suffer. Will they will suffer either just like that or under pressure with some, some uh, stimulus or stress. Or you get some similarity. If you want to make some combinatorial model, they model something like Turing machine, you know, they again plot. And the major problem was to eliminate indesirable interactions. Yes. This is exactly what happens here. Yes. We need to desire the interactions. Yes, we think that it's... Otherwise, yeah. we die. Otherwise, we die of out of chaos. Yeah, we think that it's also important. Yes, yes. I agree. I agree. Yeah. It, it must be important as well to eliminate, eliminate unwanted... Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's perhaps as important, perhaps more, more important, important. perhaps more important. Yeah. Know, people tried a long, you know, the most costly theorem improvement It cost about $10 billion to improve mm -hmm. the game, yeah, because you use the time. Mm. And it's exactly to plan the configuration and interactions again. Yes. And this was yes, because there are examples that were known a long time ago and unexplained. Like there is a, uh, a factor in, uh, in our cells that uh, responds to glucocorticoids. Okay. And it not only responds, but is the same molecule that actually influences the transcription of some genes. And it was, people were very surprised that it, it does not bind and influence a gene that has a nice binding sequence. 
in, in vivo in the physiological situation, but it does so on one that doesn't have a, a good binding sequence for the glucocorticoid receptor. These type of things are unexplained unless you, uh, you accept that the position is the, 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 the binding sequence is one thing, but there is also an uh, it, it's also relevant to consider the, the position with respect to other things. And so it, it's, it seems that it's one of the tools in the toolbox of the cells to avoid undesirable interactions, to, to, to play with the respective positions, and it seems. And they make cooperation, so square, so to speak, zero, zero. They're two opposite yes. things. Uh, yes. And they yeah. change tremendously. This is a huge fact. So if you arrange all genes, they will probably die. So we, we, are at the, we are at the verge. I mean, uh, people have been neglecting this phenomenon. Now, I, I didn't have the time to show some, some data, but we, we see that it's an important phenomenon, quantitatively very important. And, and so just to finish, because uh, we can have questions after the break, and I think we are all sweating, um, is um, now that we understand one more thing about how to organize a genome that works, that functions. We are using this information uh, to try and engineer desirable features on chromosomes, on genomes, bacterial genomes that can be used for different purposes, be useful to produce a drug or, or uh, uh, the um, precursor of uh, fabric or things like this. And, and this is the reason why uh, we, we founded this company called Synovance that you mentioned. Yeah, to, to use this principle, apply this principle, but also other principles that were known before that uh, are constraints on the, uh, the, the architecture of the, of the genome. But what can bring the, the correlation is what is known about chromatin structure. So, so we don't know. I mean, the only case where we touched upon that when in the first paper in 2003 when I worked with yeast. All the other work has been done with bacteria. Um, and for yeast, we don't know how to articulate these observations. I think it's at a shorter scale than the, the chromatin story. No, not that the nucleosome is smaller, yes. So, okay, okay, so it's at a larger scale than the nucleosome, yeah. but it is a smaller scale than the, the long range uh, organization of chromatin. But these are just words. I don't know. Is the, is the honest response. In transcription factors, uh, in the promoter regions, there are not many in nucleosomes. They not have a chromatin in, in promoter regions. Yes, yeah. uh, so that it's, 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 it receives proteins, yeah. Wow. yeah. Less than in the open reading frame, even less. Less than in the open reading frame, yes. Yes. Okay, so maybe yeah. we take a look. Okay, I see. I was Thanks. asking about possibility of modeling, yeah? That you try to model and make some quantitative, quantitative kind of estimates. Part we can do it by, of course, analytically, but part by modeling. Which can be. True. So, you could model from scratch. You could say, okay, this, give, me, uh, give me some information, I'll model from scratch. Some people have been doing that. They didn't bring much new information. Another option would be to say, give me the average distance between the partners, which we can give with our Monte Carlo model. Really, we, we give distances, real distances. We cannot give time because it's Monte Carlo, but we give distances at the best equilibrium uh, level. Give me distances, and um, I will model in order to give you now the level of activation. So if this is the, the DNA binding site, and this is the transcription factor, Protein. I'll try to tell you how much this will activate or disactivate or repress the uh, rate 
of initiation of transcription. What is rate? What is rate quantitatively? Rate quantitatively. How you measure it? Yeah, but not measure it. Ah. Rate. Do we measure it? No, I mean, what it is? What is how we define the rate? Meaning, oh. Meaning, so. It's a number. So it's a, a number of initiations of transcription per minute or per second, mm -hmm. per unit time. Uh, how many per second, for instance, how many times? Will this initiate transcription? That, that is what is controlled by the transcription factor. So that, and this would be valuable. Now on a more analytical approach, so this, this would be simulations. Oh, and, and before I forget, one of the difficulties is that we do not know the parameters well, so you could search for the parameter, but then you'd like to know the value in some cases to calibrate your, your parameters, and this is difficult to measure. There are a few data, but not many data on, on measuring this. This is the difficulty. Now, for an uh, analytical approach, Um, I would suggest that Hill 1910 could be a, a, a starting point. You mean but what, what kind of you have to do? So what do you mean? Is mathematician Hill? Yeah, but I don't know how much. I never met him, unfortunately, yeah. and <laughs> I don't know how much. And the, the what paper. Kind of, what kind of work is done on each field? So uh, what I. I can tell you is biochemists use his work in the following way, and this doesn't tell you much about, and uh, sorry, but I looked into that probably eight or nine years ago, and I don't remember the specifics. What I do remember is how biochemists use this paper. Um, biochemists. No, uh, any biochemists is he proposed a way to. Uh, okay, I'll. Uh, second. Doesn't want. Ah, I see. I see. Okay. Um, his. His work is used for the following. Consider, ah, oh, very, very nice, thank you. Consider a beaker with liquid and a semi-permeable membrane here and consider solutes of two types, one that can cross and one that cannot cross. Uh, one that cannot cross, say a macromolecule that cannot cross this hemipermeable membrane and a small salt that can cross. And put, the, put, the, put them all here and then so the macromolecule will not equilibrate and the uh, small molecule will equ equilibrate. And so imagine you have a way to measure how, how this distributes and, oh sorry, um, I forgot the most important thing. This small molecule binds, can bind the big molecule. And this small molecule, so to measure it, what do you do? You make it radioactive or whatever, fluorescent, radioactive, something. So the small molecule binds to the big molecule and, and you can follow it. And now measure, measure how much uh, a small molecule, small molecule, macromolecule, measure how much small molecule in this, is in this compartment, uh, how much is in this compartment, and then uh, you can use Hill 1910 to uh, find, ha, find out uh, two things, the, the concentration of the big molecule, but also 
how many small molecules bind per big molecule. And don't ask me more. Don't, sorry, I forgot fully. Mm -hmm. At that time, we had a, physical chem um, a mathematical physicist in the team, and a German guy. It was pretty good. And I tried to talk him into trying to restart from Hill 1910 and, and following up to, to obtain this type of information. Not this, but uh, another application towards, uh, towards this uh, result in an analytical way. And in the end, he shied away. He didn't do that. And, and, then, um, and then I forgot all the details of what we had been discussing. So uh, don't ask me more. But I can, dig, I can dig up and see if I can find again what was the idea. No, but here, I mean, very simple kind of issue. When you have kind of a round of work, and, uh, and the size when you turn terminate, and how much it depends on distribution or distance from the way that you start. And this is computable. This is a kind of elementary, uh, on a kind of homogeneous space. You can easily do that. Of course, here it's kind of more complicated. But this first, I would make a simple computation and see how much helps. In two space and three space, but where you require different answer. They might depend on dimension. But this sure. is a computation. And you just and actually, I can think I know a mathematician who can easily do it with that. Right? OK. We, it's, we still have to find the right person. Yeah. But I, I'm open, I mean, of course. Okay, I'll ask somebody. Else. Okay. I know people who do that. Okay, let me know. Thank you. Ah, I have some questions. Um, about this uh, per periodic genes um, in bacteria, are there more uh, essential and more conserved than uh, genes which are not? So, I cannot answer directly, but indirectly, yes, these 500 genes from E. coli are involved in two categories of roles, two roles. One is spatial organization, whatever it means, but it's funny because we start from a hypothesis on the spatial organization and we end up with a list of genes that are labeled spatial organization. Funny. But most of those genes are involved in macromolecular synthesis, which means synthesis of DNA, RNA, protein, which means they are very central to the life of the organism. One sub-hypothesis could have been cells had to optimize the expression of, the, of genes which produce a lot of products, massive product. For instance, we said, I mentioned ribosomes. Okay, so then it would mean that they have to, they have to uh, massively produce protein altogether and also massively produce some RNAs, like the ribosomal RNAs. So you'd think these are the massive products of the cell, and that's where you need more optimization. Okay. Well, not. Not because it's not the case because we also have DNA synthesis in the story. And DNA synthesis is not massive, unlike RNAs and protein. It's not massive. So it, it, the criterion is not... The criterion is not the fact that it is a massive production. But indeed, it's DNA, RNA, protein synthesis is the, among the, the top roles of the genes that are periodic. We come back to the previous question. If we take we your, see, so they know something like that. How many genes are now necessary to model something, but not to evaluate so to evaluate what exactly the Samson. the importance or how many genes importance you should put in the model to understand some interactions. It's it's a difficult question because it would not work if you put in four or five genes because it's a collective phenomenon. Mm -hmm. It would not work if you reduce the, the, the genome to a small size because it, it, it needs several loops 
and the loops cannot be small because of the uh, lack of flexibility of the polymer DNA. So it's not an easily reducible uh, case. You cannot say I'll work on on two genes and, and see how it works, or even five genes. You, you, you need a hundred. genome scale pattern. But hundreds is a realistic number. Hmm? Hundreds. There are thousands of those hundreds. In the hundreds of yeah. genes. Hundreds. Uh, hundreds of genes. Yeah. Yeah. No, but maybe, maybe some kind of approximation. Still, it's a huge thing, but you can use for something like that. Having clusters, an operation with these clusters, so it's not maybe modeling and point by point, but somehow kind of average of a certain group. Mm -hmm. For that, you need such huge, you could take what, 1,000? Yeah. You could from 1,000 square. Yeah. Yes, it's like 1 million. Yes. For computer, it's nothing. Then, then you should play with this parameters, it will take time. On the lattice, you mean? Or? Oh, yes, but surely you, could, you should use uh, incredible computations. No, what I'm saying is that you don't have to do it point by point. Yeah, you can average of some lesions. Yeah, mm -hmm. immediately use computation. By oh, yes, yes, yes. If you have to, exactly. if you have to so first invent the class of model and think about how to develop and do it. Actually, I forgot that there is a, a third, a third uh, approach, which would be uh, generalize. Generalize uh, Villar and Leibler. Because Villar and Leibler. Stan Leibler. In this paper, they deal with the case of two sites, two very close sites. So not only are we saying that uh, the sites can be far away along the 1D sequence of the genome. But we are saying that it's not true. It could be 200, 200 sites. Um, and uh, this model works for two. Intrinsically, it works for two. It doesn't work for three. Um, but there might be a way to generalize their approach. Uh, again, it's something that we were discussing in 2007, 8 with this German uh, mathematical physicist, Timo Wolf. And I don't remember the specifics, no, uh, but it didn't look to be an easy thing to do. The way you describe it, so many. There may be a simple mathematical argument, and immediately you show it has tremendous effect. Intuitively, it's kind of clear. It's exactly multiply things, just multiply them, multiply numbers, immediately effect become very strong. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Because we bring together, so it's not one pair, but many yes. pairs, so effect multiplies. So it might be a very huge effect. Yes, so yes. Minor effects, major effects. I agree. And therefore it will be I, I agree, but I agree from my intuition. Yeah. I mean, uh, your intuition is probably of a different nature. It's, no, no, it's same. No, it's uh, not, it's not <laughs> and uh, yeah. furthermore, yeah, we have to find a person who can, we can deal with this and will be motivated to deal with this. I'm ready to talk to the person to dig out these uh, previous ideas as well. And I suppose that it is, uh, yeah, it could be done, but um, n not me. Yeah. Okay, so should we stop? Okay. No, no, it's so kind of tantalizing, yeah, to, to, to formalize it and this mm. uh, rough computation, yeah. Mm. But of course, yes, to make it interesting, you have to know kind of, kind of data, something more information. For example, when you have the size, you have this kind of correlations. Then you may try to use it by, by clustering analysis of that. There are kind of routine things you can do first, right? And of course, collect, for example, what these genes, what these proteins, what you know about them, kind of, kind of experimentally. Right? Of course, you can make, uh, the danger you make a mathematical model, but then you miss some crucial point, yeah. Sure, sure. No, if it, you mean in simulations? In simulations. In simulations? We, have no real biology, you know. we do have some reasonable uh, orders of magnitude for the, the energy, the binding yeah. energy, for the, the, the physics of the polymer DNA. We, we do have that. No, this is very, very cutting, a very remarkable thing, yeah, absolutely. It is a tremendous, it seems to be a very huge factor, right? It's not just one of 10 yeah. or 100 or something. Because, yeah, because it's not just two, it's, right, it's exactly like many, 600, yeah. and, and they can exchange in a dynamic way. I leave 
on that side and then I can go back to the same or go to another one. And evolutionarily, again, can you estimate how to organize the structure being organized? Yeah? It's a high scale structure. So how evolutionary it should work? Okay, um, so we had this simple model which basically said um, genes belonging to the same list or no, sites, sorry, mm -hmm. sites that belong to the same list um, will, how was it, will be subjected to an attraction so it was not very realistic, it was more like a distance to the minus two type of gravitational or Coulombian, Coulombian attraction, uh, which we thought would uh, accelerate the reaching of an equilibrium. And we had to be fast, why? Because it's an evolutionary model. So evaluating one, one chromosome for its fitness should not take more than uh, 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 hundreds of a second because we have to evaluate many and we have to go through many evolutionary steps. So we had two time scales. We had the ontogenic time scale, that is evaluation of the fitness of the genome, which was simply, very simply made by saying, okay, so we have, let's say, 200 sites and after uh, folding it, we measure the distance, the all pairwise distances between these sites. Yes, that's what we did. All pairwise distances, and we take the average. And that's the coefficient of fitness. Actually, it's the inverse no, of the no, coefficient it's of fitness. The which involve, right? Probably his major, it's not just in a point mutation, right? The horizontal, horizontal transfer problem. Yeah, yeah exactly. No, no, that's what we were doing. Yeah. So, yeah, I didn't say that. So, because that's the short time scale. We evaluate the, the fitness of a genome. Then, after evaluating 100 genomes, we took, so we had the fitness coefficient, which was the inverse of this number, of the average distance, pairwise distance. Uh, we take the best. Now we have, we go one step further in the evolution. So it's a different time scale, it's a longer time scale now. We, uh, we used uh, variation operators, exactly what you said. So these were only um, of this type. Choose randomly two sites and a third site where you insert your so transpositions. We had only transpositions. So we make, from the winner chromosome, we make a hundred or more, hundred copies using trans random transposition. And then we evaluate them, and so on and so forth. And we keep the best in terms of clustering again. And then another evolutionary step for, again, with a hundred um, chromosomes made with this variation operator called transposition and so on and so forth. And after a couple of uh, hundred thousands of steps, evolutionary steps, in a few hours with a computer, we, we got things that were regularized. That is, we did have some proximity and periodicity patterns appearing mm -hmm. from a random uh, initial uh, sequence. We can do a really activities of not related to subject like transposons or some other mechanism involved, biological mechanisms. Transposons are supposed to be yeah. random. But there may be some biology attached inside the scheme. There might be some, right? I mean, uh, Misha, uh, you, are, you are going too fast. Um, it is possible, but it's really a wild okay, hypothesis. Okay, of course, absolutely. Yeah, it's it's a that. wild hypothesis. Yeah, and it's really interesting just to relate this kind of mathematical understanding. Can you yeah. imagine doing that? But if it's related to something biological, yeah, uh, we, we know that um, when, when you do horizontal, when horizontal gene transfer occurs, normally it's a continuous piece which goes to another place or to another organism. Right. Horizontal gene transfer. However, your hypothesis amounts to saying that it could be a piece of this one plus a piece of that one right. that together will, will be. And 
there are very few, I mean, there, there's no proof of that. There are some, in, some hints, perhaps, but no more than, than hints. And if you ask people in the field, I would say, no, no, no. It's not possible. You can see this, it's, uh, what you're saying, kind of in position, but I read it a few years ago in the book by Kunin, you know, about, yes. uh, about evolution of genomes. But for him, it's completely random, right? Exactly the structure completely is not the picture. And this, what you say, you, you, you just have to write the whole book, right? So. Right. Yeah. It's random until we find yeah. the regularity. It's a, a pattern of organization, <laughs> exactly. And then, I am curious, I will conclude again what he wrote, how you can, it was just on that, if you use some kind of something, and this is, if you, I'm just curious if you do what he does, but now make your uh, assumption, if you had a different answer, and the different answer you can be better correlated with the real world. You see, this is well, a could be. Kind, of, kind of computation to imagine. Mm. And there's a constraints on organization of, of, of the genome. And, and, and so we live in a different space and we live in different statistics. Yes. So there are two mathematics in the world. One inside of the cell and one in the space of genomes and evolution. His book was written before that. Yes, sure. No, no, book was written about three or four years ago, I think. Ah. Or five years ago. So he didn't read the good authors. He just, he probably didn't know. But I think he refers to the I think it might be curious about that. No, this is a two kind of issues in thematically related to what you said. One in cell and other in the space of genomes. 